There's a piece of malware called CryptoLocker that has been getting a lot of attention recently. Now, interestingly enough, both the idea behind CryptoLocker as well as some of the techniques it uses to infect a system are not all that groundbreaking, but despite that, the threat does appear to be very successful, at least from the vantage point of the bad guys. To start with, CryptoLocker falls under the category of what's known as ransomware. And this category of ransomware represents threats that have been around actually since the late 1980s. I believe the first instance of a ransomware piece of malware occurred in around 1989. That was the, the AIDS Trojan. And it's also important to keep in mind that if you look at this historically, the AIDS Trojan came about during the nascent stages of PC-based computer viruses. So to put some perspective on that, Brain, which was the very first PC-based computer virus, came on the scene in 1987. So that said, there are parts of the CryptoLocker implementation that are far more sophisticated and far more well done compared to some of its predecessors. So with that, let me go ahead and dive right in and describe CryptoLocker. Let's imagine that we have a system and that CryptoLocker infects that system. Shortly after CryptoLocker infects a system, it makes a connection to a remote CryptoLocker server. Now there's actually a more elaborate vehicle by which this step is accomplished that involves the CryptoLocker malware on the client generating a series of random looking domains until it finds one to which it can connect. But I actually won't go into the details of that step because it is somewhat tangential to the rest of the discussion. But suffice it to say that the CryptoLocker client establishes a connection with the CryptoLocker server in some fashion. The server uses a concept known as public key cryptography. And this process of using public key cryptography involves generating a pair of cryptographic keys. The first of these keys is known as a public key, and the public key can be used to encrypt data. The second of these keys is a private key, which can be used to decrypt anything that was encrypted with the public key. So if you had some data, and let's call that data D, then you can apply a mathematical transformation to that data where the transformation incorporates the public key and the result of that transformation is a corresponding ciphertext C which represents an encrypted version of that data. And then given the ciphertext C, you can apply an inverse mathematical transformation known as decryption. And that transformation incorporates the private key and it will yield back the original data D. Now it turns out that it's possible using the techniques of public key cryptography to do all of this in such a way that given just the public key, there is no known shortcut by which one can reconstruct the original data from an encrypted version of that data, at least in any reasonable amount of time. So as a corollary to that, there's actually no known way to derive the corresponding private key given just the public key, again, in any reasonable amount of time. So this CryptoLocker server will transmit the public key back to the infected computer, to that victim system. And this public key will be used to encrypt all of the personal files of that victim that it can access from that computer. And that includes things like documents, presentations, spreadsheets, and so on and so forth. Not only that, the CryptoLocker malware will also encrypt files on things like network shares, on USB drives, and also on folders associated with cloud-based file sharing services and so on and so forth. At this point, the CryptoLocker malware will then pop up a message, a warning message, if you will, telling the user that his or her personal files have been encrypted. And at this point, any attempt by the user to access the contents of these personal files is going to fail. The warning message also includes a countdown timer for, I think, 72 hours. And there's a threat that if the user fails to pay up within that time frame, then the server will delete the private key. And if the private key is deleted, effectively, the user's data will be lost forever because there's no known way to decrypt the encrypted data in any reasonable amount of time without access to the private key. Now CryptoLocker does offer to decrypt these files for the user 
by selling the user the private key. Effectively, what's happening here is the user's data is being held at ransom, which is why these types of malware instances are often referred to as ransomware. So CryptoLocker charges 300 US dollars for that key, and it offers two payment options. The first payment option is MoneyPath, and the second payment option is Bitcoin. Both MoneyPack and Bitcoin enable you to pay someone in a way that allows the recipient to keep their identity secret. It's analogous to the way that a physical cash transaction can be used to preserve the anonymity of the parties who were involved in that transaction. The victim is expected to somehow procure the funds to pay the ransom, and then he has to enter the various payment details into the crypto locker window. And upon doing so, the CryptoLocker server will provide back the corresponding private key. Then the CryptoLocker software running on the victim system will use this private key information to decrypt the user's personal files and thereby restore them. Now it turns out that there is one interesting twist with regard to CryptoLocker. If your antivirus or anti-malware software, let's say, detected CryptoLocker sometime after the initial infection caused your files to be encrypted, then it might remove the CryptoLocker software entirely from your system. And that has a weird unintended side effect in that the user can no longer decrypt their files even if they were willing to pay to get their private key. And the reason for that is that the software to decrypt those files would have been removed from the victim's computer. Now what's actually quite remarkable is that the CryptoLocker authors actually thought through this contingency. And so they actually provide a vehicle by which victims can reinfect themselves so that the victim can more easily procure the private key by providing a ransom payment. So the idea is the victim will reinfect themselves and then using the crypto locker malware that's now on their system again, they can go ahead and provide the ransom payment and get their files decrypted. So as I mentioned earlier, there is nothing particularly earth shattering about crypto locker or the techniques it uses. I would say the big interesting thing from my perspective is that it does use public key cryptography to perform the encryption, which is an improvement over how some ransomware might have performed encryption in the past. CryptoLocker just arrives on a system through basic means, things like users opening up an email attachment, or in some cases, the user may have already been infected with an existing threat, something like a Zeus or a Zbot, and then the existing threat acted as a beachhead to pull down and install a copy of CryptoLocker onto that victim system. Unfortunately, short of having antivirus or anti-malware software that detects and prevents CryptoLocker in the first place, or for that matter, having a recent backup of your data, there's not much you can do once CryptoLocker has actually encrypted your data. And that's because the authors used public key cryptography to encrypt the data. And no one is currently aware of a shortcut aside from getting your hands on the actual private key to restore your data. And so in that way, CryptoLocker, even though there's nothing that's mind blowing about what it does, it does use a lot of standard techniques and it implements them correctly. And I think that's led to a lot of its success, at least from the vantage point of the malware authors.